Listen, you're not gonna find anything on me, okay? Trust me. Empty your pockets into the tray, sir, or we'll have to. Your pockets, sir? Lady, the problem isn't in my pants. No! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. It's time for that time of the week where we talk about everything X-Men. It's time for this week at X-Men. And here with me is my good friend, the X-Men historian, the Marvel aficionado. Doc, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, you know? It was it was it was a surprisingly improved week for X Men this week. Absolutely, I agree. Obviously, I did a full review of, of X Men number one by Jerry Duggan and Pepe the Raz on the channel. I was blown away by the art. That's the best illustrated X Men comic you know I've seen from Pepe the Raz in quite some time, probably since his work in the House of X series. So I was fully impressed, especially with the giant uh, X robot mech armor thingy. Yeah, um, I mean, I watch Power Rangers too, Jerry, but well, and Voltron. I watch yep. Voltron. They, they <laughs> pick pick your giant robot with people controlling each limb uh, that all got put together, you know, Japanese inspired cartoon or television show, and yeah, we all watched it, Jerry. But still, not a bad comic. I enjoyed it. I like silly fun. You know, I thought it was a, it was a fun fight. The art was fantastic. You know, I think the the way they got there was a little silly, but it's a comic book. Sometimes it's supposed to be silly. Yeah, you know what? I I didn't really mind it. Um, as you mentioned about the the art, um, honestly, I thought Pepe Larraz. This was this was probably my favorite thing I've ever seen him draw because he. He, he, it seems like in this issue he was trying to find his own style and break away from just being another St Stuart Eminem clone and he got a lot of there was a lot more him here than a, and a lot less Stuart Eminem influence and I really liked that because it, it was a little rougher um, a little grittier um, and I can't tell how much of that was, was the, uh, the inking and the, the coloring, but they had the same colorist as before. Okay. It Marte was still Gracia's Marte. Yeah, yeah. Marte Gracia. Okay. Well then, you know what? They, they definitely have found he's, he's morphing his style. It's a little grittier, a little lack, a little extra, you know, some stronger lines, some more hatching in his art um and it seems rougher i like it um yeah i came away quite impressed there's a couple other things i liked about this issue specifically i like the inclusion of ben yorick as a you know a reporter that's aware that the mutants are resurrecting on krakow and wants to get to the bottom of it and he's, he's he's kind of buttering up cyclops there to begin with and then he starts asking the tough questions uh, i kind of dug that yeah, um, this was one of the this was one of the first things that Jerry Duggins wrote that I didn't think was just terrible. Now, I still think his writing of Cyclops is atrocious, but the way he handled that interview between that kind of casual, oh, you're Ben Urich from the Daily Bugle, you know, and and really kind of working. Uh, Scott was was good. He actually wrote that very very well. Now, granted, Scott came off as way too much of a Boy Scout, um, and and like night, like I don't know. It was like really strangely naive in that conversation. But at the same time. He, 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 you know, afterwards he shows, you know, his conversation with Gene says that he knew exactly what was going on. So I like it. It, it. it wasn't my favorite interaction. I think Scott, I don't think Scott's that good at, like, um, at hiding his true motivations. He's not the most deceptive person on the planet. He's, he doesn't really have a very good poker face. Um, but he did manage to kind of have the aw shucks, very kind of American boy 
vibe that he was trying to rub off on Ben Urich during that interview, and it was it worked. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. But there was some mischaracterizations you were kind of getting into with the characters, especially when the the mech fight between the X Men and the alien robot is finished, and the Fantastic Four and the Avengers show up, and they're just like, "Sup, buddies? Oh, how you doing, buddies?" It's like, yeah, what? there's why are all of a sudden the X Men are good now? Is, is that yeah. what's happening? Yeah, there's like there's been tension between the X Men and basically everyone, every other superhero team, and they've been establishing this for like basically since House of X and Powers of X. Uh, they they've been like Hickman. That's been one of the the main kind of um, themes in Hickman's run here is the tension between the X Men and Every, and the rest of the superhero community. Um, and then they just act like that didn't happen and everybody's best friends and they're going to their, they're going to go meet up at the clubhouse later. Yeah, I didn't, didn't like that. And then you mentioned the clubhouse. The treehouse in Central Park is one of the dumber ideas I've seen in a comic book in quite some time. Um, a treehouse? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, it's going with this weird environmentalist message sort of thing that they're doing with and I think that's kind of one of the, the subplots of of the Hickman era with this with the Krakoa and plant stuff everywhere is the you know yes we can use technology but it can be green technology I think that's been one of the subplots here and I I thought it was dumb. Um, it, it's 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 a little too folksy and I don't know, clean, yeah. just weird. Yeah, wasn't a big fan of that. But let's talk about these three villains. They, they introduced the three villains. I think it was a bit much for for the first issue. I think they should have concentrated on Cordyceps Jones, since that's the one that actually sent that robot from game world. I think that should have been like the villain of this comic book and would have had a more focused, better narrative. Otherwise kind of came off like a high spot comic. We've also got, um, Oh my goodness. What was the other, the name of the other guy? It was Kelvin hang. And we also get Dr. Stasis. Yeah. You had, uh, Kelvin that became Fei Long. Uh, I think. And he's the guy who's, Mad Technology, yeah, the the rover, the rover that he had on Mars that they destroyed. He was the third guy's stuff that got broken on Mars. Um, so I, apparently his 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 big motivation is they broke his remote controlled car. No, um, his motivation is I wanted to terraform and colonize Mars, I, I, and the I, mutants beat me there. That's I amazing. know, I know, I know. I'm just making fun of the fact that they broke his remote control car. <laughs> no, but that's a cool villain. He's got a clear motivation. No, he does. He does because he's been, you know, this is the second or third time he's had his kind of legs wiped out from underneath him. Yeah. There aren't and enough cool villains in X-Men right now. I'm happy about this. There really aren't. Um, and, and especially there aren't a lot of villains that their motivation isn't just, I'm a racist and hate mutants. Um, now, you know, this guy, he's, he's got a reasonable motivation. Um, you know, the, the alien plant thing that was in the astronaut guy, the Cordyceps Jones, was that in? Cordyceps yeah. Jones, yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a, um, well, that one's interesting. It's like a sentient mushroom. I thought that was the first appearance. Someone's saying that that character showed up in a rocket raccoon like miniseries or something fine i'm okay i'll i'll take your word for it um i mean and hey look if they're if they're repurposing like some z-list villain from a junk throwaway miniseries from 20 years ago good look you don't have to always create new things you can always repurpose old things that never really got over in the first place and make them work because they maybe they fit better now. And, I like and, the idea of game world being a big part of it. I think it makes it more fun. I, I, I 
kind of do. Um, I liked seeing the high evolutionary in the background there. Um, you know, because he's he's a he's a character that has always seemed like he would have more of an impact with the X Men, especially when it comes to sinister and apocalypse and evolution and everything. I mean, he's the high friggin' evolutionary, and but he doesn't really have a lot to do with the X-Men. He's only had a few real major interactions with them. So having him involved in the background there, I like. Um, that could be interesting. Um, so, and then, who, who was the third? The, the Dr. Third? Stasis. He's upset oh, yeah. that, that they've they've uh, made resurrection a thing when that's something that he wanted to work towards. Yeah, that one, um, I'm, I'm not sure I really care about. Um, I mean, we'll see. Uh, I'll hopefully I like he's they trying can... to meet the the mutants, you know, tit for tat, and and upgrade the the human form. Yeah, meet him on the battlefield. I, I I like the fact that all three of these villains have clear motivations and they make sense. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I don't know if they necessarily all need. And they're to not be... plants. They're not plant stock. Oh yeah, they're well, not. Cordyceps Jones might be a plant. Is that yeah? A he's like a giant like mushroom that looks like a brood that looks like. Uh, you know, Shadow King's smile. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think the only problem is you put three new villains in in one issue of X Men, and it seems a little stuffed. Um, like I, I kept like, especially near the end of that book, I'm like, okay, this next page will be the last page. Okay, this next page will be the last page. Jesus Christ. It was just like a bunch of epilogues at the end. And yeah, I need a more focused narrative. I'll give you that. The it, art was it really fantastic. Did. It carried the book. There's a fun action scene with the mech robots. I'm interested in the villains, but it it, it could have been done better. Yeah, I think I think you know, organizational wise, I think the problem was basically just if they had a better editor to organize this thing better and put it together in a little bit more. Um, coherent way it would have been a little it would have been a little better because I mean as I said I, I completely forgot the name of the third the third villain um, but I personally found it enjoyable it wasn't the greatest comic of all time certainly exceeded expectations I would say this is the best comic book Jerry Duggan has written since he's been in the X office I would I would say yes the only major issue that I have is I still think he can't write Cyclops worth a damn well, I still think he's not funny, but that's not the point. He did something better, Doc. We need to celebrate that. Yes, he did, and I will give him applaud for uh, for not for doing something that was relatively competent. Hey, I, I enjoyed it for what it was. Now let's move on to Hellions. This has been at this point, it's the most consistent book in the whole X Men line. Zeb Wells. We've got Rose Antonio replacing Steven Segovia this week. Unfortunately. The art definitely took a step back, but it was still damn fun. And we finally got to revisit Nanny and her smiley robot baby thingy. Yeah. Um, this absurd little plot point that they added in there that I'm so confused about how a how a mech armor has a baby. But um, that's what I they're will, trying to figure out. That's the, the beginning. Surprise. Yeah, I, I know. Um so I, I'm I'm good with this. It's it's a little absurd. Um, it's kind of amusing. I, I, I I'm not a big fan of. It the kind way of falls in line with what Hickman was doing. The, the evolution of AI. Now let's it, it, learn it to reproduce itself. Exactly, it does, and that is the way that you know. It, it's almost like this is this is really one of the books that's actually still on that. It's still in the, the the same vein and you know servicing uh, Hickman's original idea between the, the cloning, you know, the clone farms, uh, Sinister's clone farms, the uh, hybrids, the then add in the AI and the evolution of AI as it starts to advance itself. Um, yeah, you, you got a lot. This is really still servicing um, Hickman's original vision, and I really like it. Zeb Wells can actually write a joke. 
Yes, Jamie is can. hilarious. Orphan Maker is absolutely hilarious when he's sitting there with with uh, Scalp Hunter. He's like, Nanny says I can't come into her room to watch her undress, you know, because it's inappropriate. <laughs> and I saw something that I can't talk about. He's like, you want to take apart guns? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Scalp Hunter sitting there like I. I, I really don't care. You, you don't have to tell me anything. I really don't. You want to just play with guns? Yeah. Like, do you want to clean your guns? Oh, yeah, that sounds fine. Um, and then, you know, Nanny kind of being abusive towards Orphan Maker as she's got her new baby that she wants to take care of. Yeah. And he sort of put the baby in danger just by, uh, you know, seeing it and knowing yes. that it, that the this baby smiley robot's there. Yes, exactly. And I, I really do. I, I really enjoy this comic, the only thing that I wish, and, and now this is more of an art critique, and this is something that Steven Segovi has also failed at, in my opinion, too, and that's, you know, Scalp Hunter needs to be a little more of a hard ass. He, he really he looks does. kind of uh, limp dick in this one. He, he, you know what? They're drawing, they're, they're basically making him forge where he needs to be a, a like a stoic asshole. That's the whole point. He he's a dick. You know, Scalp Hunter is a dick. And, and the, it's the it's the the, the character interactions though really saw it. I you know the, the bringing in a new baby is obviously going to cause interpersonal conflict in in uh, w- w- between Orphan and Nanny Maker. And then you got Empath, and they're telling Empath how he saved the whole team. And he's like, "Screw you guys! I would never save any of you. You know, I hate all of you." And yeah. Scout Hunter's like, "Well, I hate it as much as anybody." And uh, I like him celebrating the interpersonal conflict, and the characters actually recognizing that maybe yeah. some of them hate each other. Yeah, and then, you know, Alex walking in and, like, he's like, he, he ends up in an awkward conversation that he's like, oh, thank God for an alarm and I have to go do something important. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's that's really the, what drives the book. I think Mr. Sinister is supposed to be the standout. I personally, I, I enjoy him. And he certainly was better in this one because we get two Sinisters. We yeah. get we get the regular Sinister, and we get the clone that was sent to Amit that was left there to die. He's returned, and I don't know, is he Scarface Sinister? Yeah, he's um, Franken Sinister. Um, it's the first time they've done a cape joke that was funny, too. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I didn't mind them bringing in those weird mutants, the tarn, the uncaring thing. Gore. Yeah, and all those other weirdo mutants from that already murdered him already before. Yeah, exactly. I didn't mind them bringing them over. Um, but at the same time, I still don't think I care about them. I, I haven't been made to care about, about no, any of those. They were, they were associated with the really shitty event. So it's up to Zeb Wells to take some, some lemons and make some lemonade out of it. We'll see what he can do with it. Exactly. And I, I am looking forward to that because I think he is one of the most competent superhero writers in that office. He, if he, if there's anybody there that can pretty much turn that, you know, swill into something that we actually enjoy, it's probably going to be Zeb Wells. Um, yeah, so it's, it's the most consistent book in the X-Men line easily. And it's one of the most consistent books, if not the most consistent ongoing that, that Marvel does. Right yeah. up there with Spider-Man, Daredevil. It, it, it really is. Um, Hellions, Hellions is still like the um, the diamond in the rough in that X-Men office, and it seems to get better with each issue because I think Zeb's really ironing out a lot of the the characters in this. Um, you know, he's getting to explore things. Um, and the focus character has shifted a number of times. Initially, it was Alex. Then it became uh, Psylocke. Then it became Scalp Hunter. Now it's back to Sinister. Um, there's been a, a continuous shift. I want where, these three issues where it's about Wild Child trying to start his pack. Yeah, oh. exactly. We're good. Oh, I give it time. We will get it <laughs> absolutely, and he will be nailing everything he can. <laughs> Do you have anything else to say about Hellions? I really enjoyed it. The art sucked in comparison to Steven Segovia. He does set a high bar. Steven Segovia is great. Uh, you know, and and I agree with you that they are making Scalp Hunter 
a bit of a pussy just as far as the way he looks. He doesn't look hard enough. Yeah, he he needs to have more of a, you know, like whatever Quanin kind of just like walked away from him. He had like this open mouth, like, yeah, sad he, like puppy, puppy dog. dog. Yeah. Yeah. No, he needed to be like an F you too, lady. Yes. Um, that because that's how Scalp Hunter would have acted, an F you too, lady. Um, his feefees no. were, were a little too hurt. Yeah, exactly. So get back a little bit in that way. You know, Scalp Hunter can really, you can have two assholes on this team. It could be Empath and Scalp Hunter. Let them both be dicks. Come on. Yeah, but that. one of them can be an asshole you respect, and the other one's an asshole you're just waiting to die. Exactly. Yeah. Um, not all not all assholes are created equally. Correct. Um, there's a joke there about porn, and I'm not going to make it. <laughs> um, but so, no, no. Uh, Hellions, definitely pick it up. Uh, the last issue this week, though, was... X Force and I'm not reading X Force because I'm tired of plant monsters. I feel like Ben Percy is actually one of my more favorite comic book writers. I think he's one of the better guys in the industry as far as what I like from a comic book. It, it feels like he's been dropping the ball for too long. I saw too many issues with Gary Brown. I know Joshua Casera returned this week, but uh, I'd, I'd have enough. Comic books are too expensive for me to just wait it out for, for something to get back to where it was before. Yeah. Mark. Um, this is the, again, this was all about plant shit. It was plants and plants and plants and plants and plants. Um, but it was probably the least irritating plant shit, um, story that they've done so far. This is one where they're, it seems like they're actually trying to figure out what they're, what they're doing here. Um, you have like a man thing and so now they're dealing with man thing a man thing virus that's being weaponized by weapons plus um then you also still have the telefloronics of terra verde plus you have the krakoan stuff um it seems like they're actually getting a cohesive narrative started finally it's only taken what like 22 issues to figure out what the actual story is here um but it seems like they're actually starting to figure out where they're going with this plant stuff and maybe it turns into something interesting but i think for for me um i still think i'm out i'm out after this it was yeah, over a, you had over a year and a half to make it interesting this is my I don't care face. I'm not going back. You, yeah. I know you're trying to sell it, but I'm, I'm not buying it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is <laughs> this is probably the, the best plant crap um, issue that they've done. But yeah, you, you, you had a year and a half to make me give a shit about this, all this plant garbage. And you meandered for way too long that I, I don't think I can give a damn at this point. Yeah, the Dark Beast stuff is just its not for me. So I enjoyed my week in X-Men. I read X-Men number one, surprisingly good. The art was fantastic. I like giant robots fighting each other you know, to the death. That's fun. I like seeing one of them lose an arm, and there's a lot of uh, good stuff in there. Some, some compelling villains, it appears, are coming to the X-Men universe. So I thought I was a promising start from Jerry uh, Duggan. We will not be seeing Pepe the Raz on art for too much longer, maybe two or three issues before they settle in on whoever the real artist is going to be. Uh, Hellions, once again, kicks ass, even with the lesser artist. Roger Antonio was not up to Steven Segovia's uh, high bar, but it was still quite entertaining. The only funny X-Men comic that there is, and I enjoyed it, and uh, you know, I've signed off on X-Force. I'm glad that you you got to check it out, but uh, I can't go back, Doc. Yeah. Um, I... I I, I surprisingly enjoyed X Men. Um, you know, it was still Power Rangers fighting Godzilla for with X Men powers, but that's hey, my, it's my wheelhouse. I mean, <laughs> cool, I guess. I mean, but you know what? The art was was exceptional. This was the first Jerry Duggan comic in at least five years that I didn't absolutely hate. Um, so yeah, an improvement. Hellions solid book uh four and a half stars 
X Men four stars. You know, X Force. I'm going to give it three stars, even though because it was, it actually did try to tell a story. It just did it a year and a half late. Hey, well, that is a good week in X-Men, Doc. I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next week to talk about whatever's happening next. We'll figure it out. All right, brother. See you soon.